Hello and welcome to the programme where you can help solve crime. It's live, of course. Everything you see is real, based on actual witness statements, and we hope that uh, you may see something you recognise. As always, detectives behind me are waiting for your call, and our main number, 018118055. And as always, you may need a pen and paper. In fact, last month, well over a thousand viewers rang us with offers of help. And before we show you this month's reconstructions, here's what's developed since then. As a direct result of last month's Crime Watch, a man has now been charged with murder. Roy Page, a 61-year-old tobacconist, was found dead at the back of his corner shop on Thursday the 18th of July. The shop was in Bedminster in Bristol. He'd run it for ten years, a much-loved figure in a close community. Viewers 50 miles away in Portsmouth thought they recognised something in our reconstruction and they rang to see if they could help. Their information led to a man from Port Talbot being arrested. He's now been charged with the murder of Roy Page. And we had an unforeseen development. Last month we asked for your help to catch a man who's robbed 11 building societies in the south of England. Take the tins out of the safe and open them. I can't. The cashiers have got the only keys. You can use the spares that are taped on the back of the door. Well, despite some helpful information, police haven't caught him yet. But thanks to your calls, they have disturbed what they call a hornet's nest of other crimes which might have gone undetected. And one man has been arrested in connection with a substantial international fraud. Back in June, we asked for your help in tracing this man, David Beatles, who accepted £168,000 for machinery he never developed, delivered. Crime Watch viewers helped track him to the West Country where he was arrested. Three weeks ago, he began a two and a half year jail term. Passing sentence on him, the judge said, of all the evils for which television is blamed these days, this is not one of them. In this case, Crime Watch has given a very useful service. Or rather, Crime Watch viewers have. The first of this month's reconstructions features an armed robbery. There are at least three gunmen and uh, finesse is not their hallmark. They're prepared to shoot almost indiscriminately and at point-blank range. The story starts with the theft of this car from a garage in Tunbridge Wells. Within the next few days, it had turned up in south-east London. July the 1st, Brayards Road in Peckham, and this blue rover had become a local nuisance. It's been parked here for five days, and a resident reports it to the police. It's A111NKN. Some of them will move it, will they? OK. And later that same day, the car was moved, but not by the police. The next known sighting of the rover was six weeks later. That's mid-August, parked here at Wimbush in Milton Keynes. But by now, the number plates are different. Nearby, two men were seen to enter the site where Marriott's are building a large electronics factory. And a third man, perhaps a lookout, was noticed outside the boundary fence. At 8.20 a.m., a Securicor van arrived to deliver wages. At about the same time, the site engineer became suspicious about those strangers. Who's that chap in the red hat there, do you know? No, I don't... What about these two? I haven't seen those before, no. Securicor had been making regular early morning wage deliveries to Marriott's for several months. They'd established something of a pattern, and the waiting strangers were obviously expecting the van to drive straight into the compound. Today, there was a change of plan, and the van pulled up outside. Although he'd been shot, the foreman got up and went on with the chase and shouted to a lorry to ram the getaway car.
Rover turned down Pitfall Road, then went left into Carter Lane. The police aren't sure if there were three or four men in the car. It was here at the Kiln Farm Industrial Estate at the back of Tesco's where they abandoned the rover. It's a mile away from the robbery. Detective Superintendent John Chilsley is the man who's now after them. But, but first, tell us something about the extraordinary bravery of those building workers. They're quite remarkable. They're very brave men indeed, but their action was one I would not recommend because those two workers who tackled the gunman were very lucky not to be killed. Indeed. There was, uh, of course, the driver of the Skirical van who was shot, shot but we didn't show that. That's right. Now, the man who shot him was the one with the yellow hat on. What do we know about that man? We've made up video fits of two men. The first one is the man, as you say, who shot the driver and the worker. He is about 30 years of age, 5 foot 8 tall, slim build. As you see, he's wearing a yellow hat and glasses, and at the time he was wearing overalls. OK, now, now we... let's, let's try and take those glasses and that hat from him and see what happens. And there he is, about 30 years of age. 30 years of age. Right, and you say you've got a second video. The second one was the man who climbed into the cab of the vehicle and threatened the guard to hand over the keys and the cash. He's about 30 to 40 years of age, 5'10", again slim build, wearing glasses, but he was wearing a black leather jacket and dark trousers. And we believe that glasses were in fact a form of disguise. And there he is, without the glasses. Does anyone recognise that man? The third and possibly fourth man you don't know, and you haven't got descriptions or good enough descriptions of them. That's right. What about the car, though? That's been all over the place, hasn't it? Starting well, in Tunbridge Wells. The car started off being stolen in Tunbridge Wells on the 27th of June. It then was seen in Peckham on the 1st of July. And from there, it next appeared in Milton Keynes on the 15th of August on the day of the robbery. We're obviously interested in the period between the 1st of July and the 15th of August, uh, wanting to know where that vehicle was and did anybody see it. And, of course, sometime between those dates, the car numbers changed. That's correct. From uh, A111NKN to B523PHA. There is uh, a reward out on this, I gather. There is a reward for anyone who recognises those photo fits and can give evidence that leads to a conviction. There's £5,000 reward. John Childerley, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the number to call if you can help, 01 811 8055. Remember that reward. You can speak in absolute confidence to a detective or, as always, you can ask for a BBC researcher. Or you can call police in Milton Keynes Direct. Here's their number, 0908 678 787. 0908 678 787. Over the past month, police forces from three counties have been involved in a massive murder inquiry, the hunt for the killer of three-year-old Leonie Cornell, or Leonie Keating, as she's become known. The investigation has been made more difficult because of the vast area involved. Leonie disappeared from the seashore caravan park in Great Yarmouth on the 13th of September. Her body was found near Mildenhall a few days later. Police have linked her murder to other attacks in East Anglia. Three years ago, in St. Osith, Pauline Coe was taken from her caravan and found unharmed, again in Great Yarmouth. This June, a man tried to kidnap a 14-year-old girl on the same caravan site where Leonie stayed. And tonight, police are able to reveal a fourth attack in the series. On the 27th of July, a man tried to abduct a young woman from the South Deans caravan park, again in Great Yarmouth. Well, the officer in charge of the operation to find this man is Detective Chief Superintendent Eric Shields. Can you tell us any more details about this fourth attack now? Yes, this young woman was taking a shower at 7am on the Saturday morning, the 27th of July, when a man entered the shower and tried to abduct her with a knife. Um, she screamed and he ran away. Now, this was an attack not on a child, but on a 36-year-old woman. How sure are you that those crimes are linked? That crime is linked with the other cases and with Leonie's murder. All the crimes have been at sea seaside caravan sites. Uh, the clothing worn, a camouflage jacket, has been used on two occasions, one in June and the one in July, and the brown car has been used on two occasions. And in three occasions, of course, girls were taken from caravans, that as so. you said. Now, you've had some more information about the brown car now. Yes, on the last uh, two days, we've had a, a woman come forward who's described a Ford-type car, an Escort or Cortina, leaving that site 
at 10.30 p.m. on 13th of September 1985. We feel that is the time that Leone was taken from the caravan and a child was seen in the back who was described as sobbing hysterically. The car was speeding faster than a car would leave that site. And do you think the child who was seen in the back of that car was indeed Leonie? I feel she was. Now, on three occasions, there were very similar descriptions given by witnesses of the man involved, and one of the witnesses has given us a video fit. Here it is. Can you give us a description of it? Yes, that? all three descriptions that have been given are the same. Uh, he described as 25 to 45 years of age, with brown wavy hair, which may be greying at the sides. Uh, he has got a brown moustache, and he's wearing on two occasions a camouflage jacket with dirty jeans and trainers. Now, to sum up, what information do you need people to come forward with tonight, and how important is it? We desperately need anybody who was on that site who saw that car leave at that particular time to come forward, and any person who knows a man who dresses like that who drives a car. We must find this man. He may strike again. All those attacks were very, very close together. They were. The brown car is crucial. If you can help, please do ring us here on 01 811 8055 or you can call Suffolk Police Headquarters direct on Ipswich 625 800. That's 0473, the code for Ipswich, 625 800. And now the Crime Watch Incident Desk. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First, some positive developments from crimes we've already covered this year. In January, a viewer in Dorset recognised something familiar in this appeal. And finally, a sticky problem for thieves in the West Country. They're probably trying to get rid of 31,000 cans of stolen silver crin hairspray, and all of them fairly new to the market. The cans of hairspray were in a stolen trailer in a man's farmyard. As a result of his call, five people were arrested in connection with the theft. All were found guilty and received a variety of jail sentences and heavy fines. In March, we joined these images together from two separate armed robberies using the Crime Watch video fit process. It gave detectives a complete picture of a man who'd robbed 15 building societies. Two weeks ago, he began a nine-year jail sentence for crimes which netted more than £18,000. And in August, we featured a half-million-pound armed robbery of a security van near the Crime View pub in Oldham. Police have now recovered most of the money and charged eight people in connection with that robbery. And now this month's cases. The first is a murder in broad daylight on a busy London street. Just before three o'clock on Wednesday the 21st of August, two men robbed this security express van at the National Westminster Bank on the corner of Old Oak Road, Acton. They got away with over £16,000, but not before security guard Sid Dundon had been shot dead on the steps of the bank. Witnesses got a good look at the two robbers. One is described as black, stocky and in his 20s and he may well have been carrying a black Adidas bag. The other was white, about 5 foot 10 inches tall, with a fresh complexion. Tattooed on his right arm, a bikini-clad woman like this, outlined in dark blue and gold dots, with writing on the bikini bottoms. This is the crash helmet he wore for the robbery. It was later found dumped near the getaway car. It's a Grand Prix make in black with gold trim, and when new it would have had a Phil Reed sticker here. And of course, it wouldn't have been damaged like this. The helmet was found with these black vinyl and cloth green gloves. You can see they're a bit torn now. So if you recognise this damaged crash helmet, give us a ring and perhaps solve a murder. Next, a series of clues that could help catch a rapist. In our film, a policewoman from Sussex plays the part of the victim. The reconstruction begins at the Bolney Crossroads, where the A23 London to Brighton Road crosses the A272. It was three o'clock and a woman was hitching on the slip road leading south to the Brighton Road. She was wearing a beige cardigan and a long green skirt. A car stopped within a few minutes. It was a red hatchback, possibly a Ford Fiesta. They travelled south down the A23 for about six miles, but then turned off just north of Pycombe towards the Devil's Dyke, a local beauty spot. It was just a mile further on, near the Brighton and Hove Golf Club, where she was raped. Her attacker, believed to be around 25, about 5 foot 9, with short brown curly hair, was wearing dark blue, heavy cotton jacket trousers. We also know he has bad acne scars on his face. He told the girl he was a lorry driver and that he's recently split up with his girlfriend. And we know he smokes Rothman's cigarettes. But perhaps this is the most important clue. A first aid box. 
and it lay in full view on a shelf on the passenger side of the car. Perhaps you know someone who fits our profile and who drives a red hatchback. If you do, ring us. Our next case is a particularly mean theft. Back in March, the parishioners of St Andrew's Church Bedford began work on this old Land Rover chassis. Months later, they were ready to present the results of their efforts to the Reverend Hall Spears, who flew in from his mission in Madagascar, especially to collect the Land Rover. Everything looked set until Friday the 27th of September, when the Land Rover was stolen from Little Staunton Airfield near St Neots. It was a left-hand drive, and its registration number was ARO700X. On its side, the words, Gift from St Andrew's Church Bedford, were clearly visible. Villagers in Madagascar badly needed that Land Rover. If you've seen it or been asked to respray it, give us a ring. A regular visitor to building societies throughout North London has so far stolen over £13,000 since the end of August. He's struck ten times to date, and in five cases he's been caught on the camera. Our first picture of him was taken on the 31st of August at the Nationwide in Haringey. Two weeks later in Camden, the Leeds permanent had a visit, but the cashier refused to serve him. Next, it was a nationwide in Holloway. Unbeknown to him, the camera caught his reflection in the glass. He claims to be armed and demands money from the cashier. Here at the Leeds permanent, he got away with £1,800, minus a bob or two. But the best picture was taken just six days ago in Hampstead Garden suburb. He's between 25 and 35 years old, about 5 foot 8 tall, and has a varied taste in hats. Finally on the incident desk this month, cast your mind back 20 years to the heyday of British football. Giles. And yet inside foot, there's Quicksall. Oh, and there's present for Quicksall, who's got number three. Albert Quicksall's goal helped Manchester United through to the 1963 FA Cup final. United beat Leicester to win the trophy and Albert Quicksall, as the winning player, took home a gold medal as a personal reminder of victory. All Albert's medals were kept on his wife Anne's charm bracelet, which was stolen from their Manchester home on Monday the 9th of September. The bracelet had four medals on it, all engraved A. Quicksall. Most precious of all was a solid gold 1963 FA Cup winner's medal like this, with its distinctive shield featuring three lions. Then there was his Division II Championship medal. This one's a base metal replica of the gold original, bearing the inscription, the Football League Champions Division II. And look at this finely detailed Silver League representation medal. Two like this were stolen. The market price for all these medals is very low, but to the quicksaws they're priceless. If you've seen them, or anything else on this month's incident desks, please give us a call. The number to ring, if you can help, is 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Detectives have been baffled for over a year now by the death of a London woman, Beverly Trendle. Police found her body in her flat about a month after her death. She'd been stabbed. Beverly's diary and some of her personal letters were missing. Exactly when she died is not certain. What is known is that from Halloween onwards, October the 31st last year, Beverly wasn't seen again. Why she died is a mystery too, unless you can remember something which could lead police to her killer. Beverly's mother, Betty, agreed to appear in our reconstruction in the hope that something might jog your memory. You just feel so cold inside, you know, it's such a dreadful thing to happen, and not knowing what's happened or who's done it. And this is the awful thing about it, I think. She didn't flit about with a lot of people and get involved in different things. You know, you can't, you just can't understand why. Beverly Trendle lived in a council flat on this estate in Northolt, West London. When she moved here four years ago, she'd been very pleased to get a place of her own. Beverly's flat was very compact the way she'd worked it out. Everything was worked out to a a definite degree, you know, so that she had everything just where she wanted it and there was nothing sort of out of place, really. She had this large book, like an exercise book. I think she would have put in it the things that happened, particularly from day to day, that, or something new had occurred, she would put it in there, that sort of thing. She was very precise and she did 
uh, enjoy her privacy very much. This is the reason that she never told people to casually drop in. She was like a different person in Spain. I don't know, as soon as she got there, she seemed to change completely. The sun, she loved the sun, and she loved to be sort of casually dressed and sort of just wander around. ¿Cómo está usted? ¿Cómo está usted? She definitely would have liked to settle in Spain, and I think really this was it. She wanted to get her Spanish to perfection. So, of course, she decided she would take these lessons. Buenas tardes, señorita. Buenas tardes, señorita. The weekly lessons took place at her Spanish teacher's house. She had booked one for six o'clock on Wednesday, October the 31st, Halloween. She didn't arrive. Her movements throughout that week are a mystery. You like to repeat them straight after me. Police do know that on the Monday, she started a part-time job for a cleaning company. Is your first day here as well, is it? Yes, it is. Still half asleep, it's that bleeding early. It's the worst thing about this job. I'm trying to get an evening job. Mind you, the traffic's not bad this time in the morning. Mm, you've got a car then? Yeah, it's old, but it goes. I won't mind an evening job. I'm going for an interview at Hillington Hospital on Thursday. I think there might be something going at Heathrow. Mind you, evenings. I wouldn't like to think I was losing my evening. No, well, there is that about. The Byron pub is just round the corner from Beverly's flat. She was also seen there that week. The barmaid was Vivian Starsmere. Uh, two halves of lager, pineapple and orange, please. She remembers taking that order from a man in his 30s who was having a drink with Beverly and two other people. None of her companions that night have been seen since. <laughs> Pubs were a place of often meeting somebody or just going to dropping in with somebody, but they weren't somewhere that she went sort of all the time or or even say once a week. Isn't he lovely? You can always see his beard gut in photos. He says it's the way he's sitting. <laughs> well, he looks all right to me. I'll bring some of mine in tomorrow if you like. Who's that then? Well, I got quite a few of my bloke in Spain, Pepe, because I haven't been over there since May. Actually, I've got a new boyfriend going out tonight for a drink, as a matter of fact. What's he like, then? Well, I haven't known him only a few weeks, but he's, uh, he's older than me. What, about 40? Yeah. He's not bad-looking. He's got a really nice personality. Has he now? And I suppose he's taking you out in his big fast motor tonight, is he? <laughs> no, I'll take mine. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. See you tomorrow. See ya. But Janet Swan didn't see Beverly again. In fact, she was possibly the last person Beverly spoke to. We know she went home that Wednesday after work. She always used to park her car so that she could see it from her flat. It could have been that afternoon, certainly it was one day around then, that a neighbour remembers seeing something that surprised her, a rare visitor in Beverly's flat. <laughs> Early that evening, children toured the estate playing Halloween games. But at Beverly's door, there was no answer. I feel now at this stage, if, if something can be done, I owe it to her for, for her sake. And also for maybe somebody else. Who knows? Well, Detective Inspector Roger Parsons has been in charge of this investigation for the past year and still no clue, for example, as to who those people in the pub were. No, we've carried out extensive inquiries on these people and um, they haven't yet come forward and they could, could be very important witnesses and I do ask them, uh, if they see this programme or people know them, ask them to come and contact us at South Hall Police Station. Could we have your description of them? 
th there was two men aged about 30 years. We have not a lot more description. They were just about 5'8 average, but with them was the, uh, the, uh, the, sem the coloured girl. She's a half-caste, but very attractive with an Afro-style hair, and I feel sure she would have stood out in the bar and public house. Mm. What about the man who was seen waving at Beverly's flat window? Any leads on him? Again, we have no leads, and this, is, again, is a very important clue because Beverly kept her flat to herself, and to allow a man into the flat would mean that she knew him well. And again, I ask him to come forward if he sees the picture of himself or if people know him to notify us, please. Mm. And no description of him at all? Again, about 35 years, uh, grey hair, uh, swept back, um, and, as I say, um, quite attractive. That's and the diary, is, is that a very important clue, the diary and the personal letters that went missing? This diary is very important. It went missing. It's never been found. Uh, this is a mock-up, but Beverly kept every item that she did during a day in this book. And without a doubt, if we found this, it could well solve this crime. Now, there's also some mystery surrounding Beverly's car. Her white Volkswagen was being driven down Yedding Lane, Northolt, very near where she lived, seen the day after it's thought that she died. And it wasn't parked in its usual position in the car park when her body was actually found. So how much significance do you attach to that? I attach a lot of significance to it because, as you can see from the, where the car's parked, uh, Beverly couldn't see it. And one sh thing she always did, she parked the car opposite her kitchen window so she could see it because it was her pride and joy. And, and she can't be seen from that window from her flat. Can you think of any reason why she should have been killed? None at all. I've been on the case for a year. I feel I know Beverly like a sister. Uh, she was a, a nice girl. She had very few friends, but most friends, they liked her, and there is no reason why this has occurred. Um, and I ask people to come forward and, and help us on this inquiry. Yes, we need the people in the pub, and we need the car, and we need the man in the flat. If you can help, give us a ring on 01811 or ring Police Direct at Southall Police Station. The number there is 01900 8147 or 8148. That's 01900 8147 or 8148. Now, some faces you may recognise, and if you do, please let us know. With this month's photo call, David Hatcher and Helen Phelps. First on photo call this month, detectives want to talk to this man, Thomas Mooney, about a murder outside a London pub. It happened at the Artichoke pub in Camberwell Church Street, where a man was shot dead just after 10 o'clock on Tuesday the 28th of May. Thomas Mooney is 23, 5 foot 11 inches tall and has fair hair. He's of Irish descent but has a London accent. If you've seen him since May or know where he is now, please ring us. Next on photo, call this man who's wanted by police forces in three counties. He left this picture behind at a bank in Chester when he tried to cash a number of stolen travellers' checks on Friday, August the 30th. The photo was on this Belgian national identity card, naming him as Michael Stefan White. So he could be a tourist or a foreign businessman, or perhaps just posing as one. Chester police think he'd been in the Hampshire and Dorset area in mid-August. He was then calling himself Johan Leon Bucherat. Whatever name he uses, if he slips you his calling card, or, if you know him, give us a ring. Police in Gwent are anxious to trace this woman, Christine Lane, who's been missing for 16 months. She was last seen at a home on the Gare estate in Newport on the 6th of June 1984, but none of her family have heard from her since. Christine is 35 years old, 5 foot 6 inches tall, with brown hair and a scar on her left cheek. If you've seen her or any of her other photo call faces, Please let us know. And here's the number if you think you can help. 01 8055. Again, 01 8055. Our last case is a robbery, and it's one police think may involve a gang who have been responsible for several other crimes. The victim was a businessman, Andy Christian, who owns a company in Liverpool that runs coach trips throughout Britain and Europe. A couple of months ago, he was attacked and injured. And it's the unprovoked use of violence that makes it so important that this gang is caught. Our reconstruction begins two weeks before the attack, when, perhaps it was just by coincidence, his company was broken into. On Thursday the 1st of August, Andy Christian was making up wage packets and the foreign currency his coach drivers would need for their trips to the continent. 
Andy spent 10 years building up his company, Amberline, from a single minicab to a fleet of luxury coaches. He's something of a workaholic, and he was still in his office when the night watchman came on duty. Andy's offices are close to Speak Airport. There's a company garage and a 24-hour petrol station. His home in nearby Woolton is about 10 minutes' drive away. He's lived there in an old converted lodge house for 15 years. That Thursday evening, as always, all business calls to Amberline were diverted to the old lodge house. Amberline? Yeah? Yeah, can I have your name and address, please? escaped with £16,000. Two weeks later, on Friday evening, Andy was getting ready to leave work at the end of a busy week. He'd not had time to put his takings in the building society, and because of the recent break-in, he decided to take the money home. He left Amberline shortly after seven o'clock. Five coach loads were off to Spain the next day, so he intended to be back at 3 a.m. to see them off. He'd been to the city centre to post his pools coupon. The new football season began the next day. He finally reached home at about 10 to 8, but someone was waiting for him. Get his wallet! Leave me alone. The money's in the briefcase. Oh. Where's the car keys? They're on the table. Which way do we go? Just go! The officer hunting those men is Detective Inspector Jeff Harrison. Inspector, first of all, let me ask you about uh, Mr Christian's condition. Yes, the physical scars have now healed, but the mental scar will remain forever. He suffered a vicious attack. I remember it for the rest of his life. I mean, he offered no resistance, and yet they, they attacked him quite strongly. They did, yes. Nasty now, attack. was it just coincidence he'd taken all that cash home that night? Could they have known? Well, since the first burglary, uh, he took the money home because he had to pay the drivers out on the Saturday morning. So uh, that was the second Friday that he had taken so much money home. Right, I take it he takes uh, precautions now. He's uh, completely changed his security system. Right. And he's now using the services of a private security firm. Another coincidence, or was it the break-in two weeks before the assault? No, from inquiries we've made and the information we've received so far, we believe that the, uh, these three men are part of a group of 10 or 12 uh, men in the southern Liverpool area who are committing similar offences. A gang of 10 or 12? That's what we believe so far. Now, how can viewers help find who these people are? 
Well, we're after information. Stolen in the second attack was the gentleman's wallet, a black leather wallet with the initials JAC in gold lettering. Uh, that wallet contained £3,000 in £50 notes. Now, presumably the wallet would have been discarded after they took the money. Uh, we hope so, and we hope for information re regarding its whereabouts, yes. OK, so what wallet with JAC, or those letters removed from it. And what That's else good. have you got there? Also stolen from the attack was the gentleman's Daimler car key ring and four car keys. Right. So anybody who's found that discarded anywhere. And uh, the money that was in there, the £3,000, was that in any set denomination, or are you just looking for a lot of money? They were all £50 notes in the wallet, and we're hoping for information that anyone's seen news in the area spending £50 notes in public houses, off-license shops, etc. Now, as we said in the film, uh, he was an hour late or so getting home that evening because he'd been into town. So presumably they'd been hanging around waiting for him. If, if people had seen anything suspicious on the 16th of August... What would they have seen? Well, Lots we hope that um, it's a busy junction. F five main roads uh, join on the top of the hill, and these men must have been there for at least an hour before the uh, gentleman arrived home. And we're hoping for information regarding the sightings. OK, there's his home, uh, the lodge, uh, junction of Beaconsfield Road and Church Road in Walton, and you can see it's not far from uh, Amberline Coaches. There is, of course, uh, a reward being offered. Yes, this is a vicious attack with uh, hardened criminals, and Mr Christian has re offered a reward of £2,000. Right, well, there you are, £2,000, no questions asked. If you can help us uh, find these people, help the police arrest them. If you think you can, uh, ring us here in the studio, 811 or ring Merseyside Police at Belvale Police Station. Uh, that's Liverpool 777-4283. That's 051-777-4283. All the numbers we've given you tonight are on CFAX as usual and they'll be there all this week on page 186. If you can't get through to us or you don't have access to a phone, please write to us. Here's the address. Crime Watch UK, BBC Television Centre, London W12 8QT. And finally, an urgent appeal from detectives involved in a murder hunt in West Yorkshire. Uh, this laundry ticket was found ten days ago in a car boot and with it was a body that of a man called Sandy McClelland. Now, the ticket is tiny, it's about two centimetres square, and it's salmon pink in colour, with the marking F, quarter, 20, stroke, six on it. If you recognise that ticket, please do ring Leeds Police, 0532 43228. That's 0532 42228, or, of course, ring us here in the studio. Uh, that's it, except uh, to say we'll be back with the Crime Watch update at uh, 11.35. I can tell you we have some very, very strong news coming in, particularly on that robbery in Milton Keynes. We'll tell you about that at 11.35. Uh, just to add a familiar word of uh, comfort, we've shown you some nasty crimes tonight. If they give you the impression it's not safe to go to sleep, please do take heart. Ladies' figures show, in fact, that uh, in real life, unlike television, less than 5% of crimes involve any violence at all, so it really is rarer than people think. Don't have nightmares, do please. Sleep well. We'll be waiting for your call. For the moment, good night. Good night.